Well, listen, um, it's good to be in worship. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just always a great opportunity to see all of you, to see and have all of you join us at home, uh, wherever you might be. Uh, so no matter whether it's at home or here, it's a sacred spot. And we ask that over this hour that you do just that, that you clear your mind, that you make this a sacred space as we come and as we worship God. We're in the second week of our series, uh, Living Hope, and today I'm going to talk about how we can have calm in chaos. How many of you have ever had chaos in life? Every hand goes, woo, right up, you know? Well, let me tell you a little story. Um, Patty and I accepted an opportunity on a couple of occasions to go sailing with some very good friends of ours. Uh, we have an opportunity to go out on the Gulf. They have a sailboat. They take us out. And each time we go, we've always enjoyed the calm waters. We've enjoyed the daylight. We've enjoyed just the fellowship of those opportunities that we are together. And on one occasion, they kind of mixed it up with us a little bit. They said, instead of going early in the day, let's do a, an early evening cruise. Now, listen, I, you know, I've never been out in a boat at night on the Gulf, a small boat, sailboat, uh, sharks around. Get, get my drift. Yeah, I watch Shark Week, so that's kind of fresh in my mind. But, you know, uh, but I've been on, you know, cruise ships and that, and it's no problem being out at night. So we were a little bit, eh, I don't know, but we went ahead and we said, hey, let's do that. And we went out and we had some fun. We were, we're enjoying our time together. We're catching up on our families. We're telling stories. I even had us singing the song to Gilligan's Island, okay? And, you know, we are just having a great time. And all of a sudden, the sun goes down. And things got a little bit peculiar. Now, listen, I'm, I'm a little bit obsessive compulsive in some areas of my life. And one of the things is, is I like to kind of know what's going on and I anticipate, you know, what could happen, what couldn't. And I've always made good that whenever we've been out in a sailboat to look and see what the markers are, the land, the horizon, and, and kind of memorize, you know, where we're at and how we get back. And during the day, that's never a problem, is it? Because you can kind of see everything. And now all of a sudden, it was dark, and all eyes turn to Captain Steve. We're like, what are we going to do now? It's dark. Where do we go? And I have to tell you that, that Steve was very deliberate. Steve was very decisive. Steve is not just some ordinary kind of like, Slap happy captain. He actually grew up in uh, Puerto Rico. He's a part of our church. He and Holly are part of our church. He grew up in Puerto Rico. Steve actually had an opportunity to sail on the U.S. Olympic sailing team at one time in his life. Yeah, so he's like no novice, right? And, but, he, but he turned that down because he just said it wasn't right for him at the time. So we, we find ourselves in total darkness on the Gulf, and I know that Steve saw the panic coming. It wasn't Patty. She was strong and laughing and having a great time, but I was kind of like getting ready to cry like a baby. I, I didn't like this. I mean, it, it was kind of out of control, and, and, and I couldn't kind of put the pieces together. And if you know me well, you know that that kind of stuff bothers me. So Steve read that panic in my eyes, and he began to bark out commands, you know, kind of a captain of his vessel, barking out the commands, telling us where to sit precisely and places to go and things that we need to do. And we all listened to exactly what Steve said. Why? Because we knew that he knew. We knew that he knew what to do. We knew that he was the one totally in command. And listen, he was the only one who knew the difference between uh, starboard and, 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 and the bow, okay? And, and so we, none of us knew that, starboard and stern. No one else knew all that, but Steve did, and we trusted him, and we knew him, and we knew that he knew, and we knew that we didn't. So not long before we were cracking jokes and making merry of the voyage, when the sun was going down, the whole area turned pitch black, the movement of the boat, Steve barked those commands, and he very correctly turned the vessel back in the direction that he knew was the place and where we could go. We had no choice but to trust him. And I knew that he wasn't like some novice or some hireling that we had paid to take us out on a sunset voyage. This was our good friend. Our lives mattered to him. And he was going to make darn sure that we got back safely. Now, that's life, isn't it? I mean, so, so I kind of tell you a little fun story about our life and some of the chaos that came from that evening sail. But, but that's life. Life kind of does that, right? So today, we're living in somewhat of a chaotic situation in our life, right? We're looking, we're, we were living and moving through record unemployment. 
We've been recently living through record ICU and beds in hospitals being taken up because of this Delta variant. Uh, victims of chaos populate those things. They populate the unemployment lines. Victims of chaos populate the ICU beds. And in one moment, everything is smooth sailing, plenty of light. We see our way, and the next time, it's like darkness. It's like chaos, and we, we're not really sure what to do. You see, those kind of journeys, they test our captain, don't they? My captain was being tested on the Gulf in a, in a 25-foot sailboat. But our life journeys test the mettle of our captain. And oftentimes, when we get into those chaotic situations, and listen, you've lived through chaos. You, some of you are in chaos right now. You know exactly what I'm saying. We get in those situations sometimes of chaos, and we ask those questions. Does, does God know what he's doing? Does God care about me? Does, is God going to do that? Or more importantly, why does God allow this chaos in my life? And those are the questions that we find ourselves asking, isn't it? And those are the things that we find ourselves in. So like a, a sailboat on the waters in the middle of the night, the chaos of life worsens. And sometimes even God's instructions, how to navigate those, those difficult waters, sometimes those instructions are perplexing. And we're not sure. And we're not really sure what we're going to do. And for some of us, we are just determined that it's going to lead to total disaster. And that's where we see life. So this morning, the, the critical question for you to ask, for me to ask is, how do you, how do I, how do we handle chaos? What is it that chaos does for us? What does it do to us? And how do we navigate through that? Can, can we say about God what I said about my friend, Captain Steve? Can we say that, that he's not a hireling? But because he loves me and because I am valuable, that God is going to navigate you, God is going to navigate me, just like Captain Steve did, through the chaos that is coming through life. You see, sometimes we kind of just scoff at chaos. Oh, ha, ah, it's just whatever, you know. But listen, it's real. I was reading in the paper this week in Pinellas County, over 5,000 persons are going to be evicted from their homes in the next 20, 20 to 15 days. For 5,000 people, 5,000 families, maybe some of you, because they haven't been able to keep up with their rent or their mortgages because of the challenges in the case. Don't you think that that's going to, to bring chaos? There are people who struggle with terminal illnesses, they know that they know that they know that the day is coming that they are going to die, die earlier than they anticipated because it's a terminal diagnosis and the chaos that comes in the midst of that. How about if you've had a, a, a wayward child? How about if you've had a child, your child, a special child in your life that you've raised, you've poured everything into, and for some reason they got off on the right track or they listened to the wrong voices? or they've gone through a divorce, or they're going through a divorce, or they've been through an abuse situation, your heart as a parent just, just bleeds for your child and the chaos that comes. And we see the significance of those things. So chaos, listen to me, chaos can be paralyzing. Chaos breeds fear. I mean, think about it. Fear that comes by being left alone, fear that of losing someone you love, fear of losing your money. I mean, today, I mean, we have people who are fearful of losing money, fear of not being able to accomplish something, fear of, of what's next for your future, that uncertainty, the fears that come. Chaos emerges when circumstances are out of your control. That's when chaos comes. Chaos affects your emotional state of mind. But if you're not careful, it's going to play games with your mind theologically. It goes back to what I mentioned earlier, that theologically, when chaos begins to take my mind over, I begin to question God. I begin to question God's sovereignty. I begin to question God's ability to be all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving because of the chaos that comes. When life is out of control, it can cause us to not believe 
the things we know to be true. Think about it. How many times have you left here on a Sunday, whether Pastor Pam or me, has shared with you a word of God? And you said, the preacher said life is to do this, this, and this, and we tell you about the upside of, of the glory of God and the power of the resurrection and that Jesus can truly heal and mend and bind. And then you go home and you're not experiencing that in your life. Some of you have said, if I hear that on Sunday, why can't I live it on Monday? You following me? Sometimes we think that. And it's there. I'm not sure what's real, we think. And that's why I think fear is contagious. It doesn't take a lot of fear to cause chaos. All it takes is for someone to be a carrier of chaos. If I'm a carrier of chaos, and I'm hanging with you, and you're hanging with me, and I'm talking about chaos, and I'm just carrying that around with me, all of a sudden, I'm going to bring you down with me, right? Have you ever been next to somebody who's just a negative Nelly? If your name's Nelly, I'm not picking on you. I just... It's a rhyming thing, right? If we're not careful, people can carry that into us. And we can see that. When life is chaotic, when life doesn't feel fair, when we feel that life is just out of control, chaos. Now, last Sunday, I defined hope, and I said to you, I said, I said hope is a lot of things, but hope is not optimism. And I shared a little bit in, on Wednesday, Digging Deeper. If you haven't seen that, go back and watch this past um, uh, Wednesday at 1, Digging Deeper. I talked about you know, hope in a sense of the difference between hope and optimism. I said optimism is something that we, that we have to control, and hope isn't that. And I, and I said that Oftentimes, the scriptures talk about types of hope. It talks about wishful hope. And I said wishful hope is, is really nonsense, and you can't put your life into wishful hope. That's, I wish this happens. And I think I used the example of I wish that that traffic light stays green so I get to work on time. And I talked about expectant hope. And I said, even expectant hope, we take action to do something. I talked about planting a seed and hoping that tomato plants come. And, and expectant hope requires some buy-in. But, but even expectant hope doesn't always happen. I can put those seeds in the ground and I can water it, I can fertilize it. There's no guarantee that those plants will grow the way I want them to. There's no guarantee that it will produce the fruit that I hope and saw when I put them in the ground. Expecting hope. And I told you that the kind of hope that we're really talking about in this series is what? Mary Vaughn, call it out. Certain, Certain hope. Mary gave away the punchline on Wednesday at 1. <laughs> no, she didn't. I'm happy Mary was listening on Sunday. Certain hope, and certain hope is something we can bet our life. And in fact, that's what I said. You can bet your life on certain hope. One of the things that really speaks to me is, when I read the scriptures, is to look at the life of the apostles, the disciples. And, and I kind of take a step back and I say, you know, if I was, gonna, if I was going to record a, a narrative in the largest selling book in the world, and I was telling a story about my experience, my choices, my life, my decisions, I'd probably make myself look pretty good. But the reality is the disciples are raw with what they say. They talk to us about their failures. They talk to us about their missteps. They talk to us about how they just don't get it and the reality of where that story is. And we go to John chapter 20, and that's exactly a story that we find. In John chapter 20, the rawness of chaos after Jesus' death and burial becomes real. And, and we see this unfold. Just a few days before, Jesus was welcomed into Jerusalem on the back of a colt. They treated him like a king. They hailed and said the word Hosanna, which is the, the highest honor that one can give to a great leader. And a couple of days later, they tried him, they crucified him, and they buried him. And the hope was lost, and darkness ensued. A pall hung over the balance, and chaos prevailed in the land. And we see through this story in John chapter 20 that if you've ever experienced death of a loved one, <coughs> which these disciples did, if you have ever experienced death of a loved one, then you'd know where they were. 
The life that you had anticipated, the life that you enjoyed, the the vacuum and the absence of your loved one who is no longer with you, it's devastating. It produces chaos. And that's exactly where these disciples were. And the story tells us that Mary had gone to the tomb on that day, which we call Easter Sunday. And she had gone to add more spices to the, because Jesus' burial was very quickly because it was almost at the time of the Sabbath and they threw him in a tomb and they quickly did some burial preparations and they didn't really finish it. And she gets there and she looks in and she notices one thing, that the body of Jesus is gone. And can't you imagine how her heart started palp- palpitating at that moment? Jesus is gone and it's chaos. She goes back and she finds Peter and John and and she tells him what she has seen. And and it's almost like you're right out of the Tokyo Olympics that Peter and John, like sprinters for the gold medal, they head back to the tomb. And they look and they see that the tomb is empty as well. Jesus is gone, chaos. Fear has gripped these good friends of Jesus. Chaos has set in. And there's no mention as to what to do. But listen to how John records this. Later that day, the disciples had gathered together, but fearful of the Jews had locked all the doors in the house. You hear the fear? They're hiding. They're not being bold. They're not being you know, out there. They're not pushing the news of the gospel. They're hiding. They're cowering. They're afraid because chaos is ruling in their life. And then John says, Jesus entered and stood among them. Remember, he's dead, but now he has, is alive, and he stands before them, and what does Jesus say? Three very important words. Say them with me. Peace to you. Peace to you. So Jesus is communicating this very important words. Everyone living in chaos at this moment, is hunkered down. They're afraid. They're in the midst of this. They're fearing for their own life, and they're thinking, if we make even one sound, the Romans will hear us, and our fate will be just like Jesus's. And Jesus enters the room, and he says three words that turn chaos into hope. Peace to you. Now, the word Jesus used is actually the Hebrew word shalom. And shalom means a soulful peace. It's not just something like, hey, how you doing? It's kind of a transformational, whatever has been rocking your world, it's all taken away now. And Jesus brings that kind of peace. It's, com- it's completeness, it's soulfulness. It's the peace that only can come from God. And Jesus says those three words that bring the people out of darkness into light. Peace to you. You see, how do we find hope in chaos? You and I need to pray that Jesus would walk through the closed doors of our life. That the same Jesus that walked through the locked doors and the, and the closed walls there in the Jerusalem in the upper room, that we invite him to do that for us. To come in and to welcome him into the midst of that. And listen, it's, it's hard to think that way. We're being bombarded again about the variant of the coronavirus. We're being bombarded again about everything that we're seeing. Chaos is running rampant. But let me say this. We need to stop obsessing about who's carrying the virus. And we need to start acting about how we can be carriers. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. You can either be a carrier of fear... And when we're carriers of fear and we get around other people, we begin to share. If you've ever been with someone and, and, and your whole demeanor has changed and you are afraid of something or you're having a bad day, you are going to influence all those people that come in contact with you. You're going to carry whatever your emotion is right, right into their life. But when Jesus said, peace with you, I believe... He's commanding you and me to be carriers of hope. Now listen, we can can have fears. I believe we can be faithful and still have fears. I believe that because that's what separates us from God. And that's where God magnifies God's presence most. When we're not sure, 
God shows up, just like here in John 20 with the apostles. The disciples were unsure, and God showed up. Jesus was there to remind them. You see, it says here in John 20, the disciples seeing the master Jesus with their own eyes, they were exuberant. And Jesus repeated his greeting, peace to you. So we can either be carriers of fear, we can be carriers of chaos, or we can be carriers of hope. Who in your sphere of influence needs hope today? Who do you know? Who do you live near? Who do you associate with? Who do you play golf with? Where do you go to eat breakfast? And you see somebody whose head is hanging low at a table. Who can you be a carrier of hope to? And how can you bring that hope to get to them in a powerful way? You see, there we were on this sailboat. It's getting darker. The lights are gone. We're not sure. The wind's picking up. The, the boat is kind of teetering and tottering and yawing. And yes, I've done some study. Yawing on the waves. And we began to see. And out in the middle of the gulf, we find ourselves in chaos it could have been a lot worse had we not had Captain Steve at the helm. But because he was who he was and is who he is, he brought us out of the chaos of that darkness safely back to the marina, to the light. That's what God does, folks. God loves you, and God comes in the midst and penetrates the walls of your fears. He goes where you have stamped everyone else out and he breaks through the doors and he says three words, peace to you. Peace to you in the midst of what your life is. But here's the other thing. If we go to John 20, 21, listen to how Jesus ends this thing. He says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. So, so, so this is kind of this... Um, Sowing and reaping, this blessing of reciprocity. So often, we just kind of like, you know, we want to be like the sponge and Jesus is the water. Fill me up, Lord. Fill my cup. I'm dry. Fill me up. And oh, now I'm full. And we want to walk around fat, dumb, and happy because God's done what, he's, what we've asked. He wants us to wring that grace that he has put into us. He wants to wring that strength that he has instilled to us that we pass it on to others. Because our faith will go nowhere if we keep it to ourselves. And the command is, we are being sent. Listen, if you still don't connect with this, if you're not connecting the dots, let me end with this. It's, it's one of my favorite scriptures. Last week I told you that there's over how many promises in the Bible? 7,000. Who counted them this week? BJ's back there going, Alan made me. <laughs> 7,000 promises in the scriptures. And I think it's found here in Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when the earth quakes and, and the mountains begin to crumble into the sea. Did you hear that? We will not fear when the waters or the oceans begin to foam and the earth begins to quake and the mountains begin to fall. We will not fear when these things start happening, when the chaos starts coming, we will not fear this. Why? Because in the midst of life's chaos, Jesus always says three things. Say it with me, peace to you, amen?